Dr. Kanchuka Dharmasiri, it's my honor to welcome you to my channel, Atramadhyava, to speak about drama, contemporary Sri Lankan drama, because I have been talking about drama with some uh, actors who are very much involved in the scene and have also been involved in the protests that are currently undergoing in Colombo and other areas, uh, particularly golf phase. And uh, it's very interesting because they say why they are marching now, why they are protesting now. And they also speak about, as uh, Kaushalya and Jerome, for example, are very senior artists. And they've been tracing their own personal journeys on this part of drama as resistance, right? And you have, for your work, for your doctoral work, researched on Sri Lankan drama. And you have an academic viewpoint from, you know, since independence to now. Uh, the essay I'm choosing to base my discussion on was written, I think, in 2014. The book came out in 2014 called Grave Macmillan. And this is the book. Do you have the original with you, uh, Dr. Yes, Mandabash. Excellent, right? And that, shall we start by explaining what that is, uh, Dr. Dharmasiri, because it's very, uh, it's heartening to see your academics contribute to uh, internationally edited volumes and take our story outside. And therefore, I'm doubly honored that, you know, you're here and you're, you're working on it. Let's first say what this is, so that we can also have a global outlook, go, global understanding before we come to the Sri Lankan situation. Go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Madhubarashini. First of all, I would like to thank you for having me here. And this is a wonderful series. So thank you for doing that. Um, yes, so um, what I try to do in this particular article is uh, I, I'm trying to trace uh, the trajectories of Singhala and Tamil theater. Because something that I have seen um, in, in writings about Singhala or Tamil or Sri, let me say Sri Lankan theater is the fact that people write either about the Singhala theater or Tamil theater or English theater. So there's not so much of a uh, interweaving of the three. Uh, or, or, or even two. So my when I started writing this, uh, that was one of my basic uh, goals. I just really wanted to look at how Singhala and Tamil theatre developed. And I, I wanted to bring in English, but it was just already too complicated, so I couldn't do that. And um, so in the process of doing so, I discovered all these things that I actually didn't know. Um, for example, the way in which uh, Singhala and Tamil theatre at this very sort of uh, interesting interaction in the 1950s and how both of them sort of um, influenced each other. And so these are things that we, we, we don't even learn in schools or in our curriculum. So it, it just took me in these uh, different directions. And, and then um, you make a, now since you spoke about that kind of artificial division, which mm -hmm. we in the present have put back, you know, it's always the history is determined by how we look at it from the present. And we have kept these two separate. And you yes. beautifully show how, you know, the Kutu tradition influenced, the, you know, and the, the Singhala drama, even Sarachand, something that we might not be talking about. And then how both were influenced by Nurti Nadagam and how much cross-fertilization happened. Yes. And you trace, you know, kind of the tragic fact that national then came to mean Singhala drama. Mm -hmm. Right, and shall we talk about some of the Tamil dramatists who were working simultaneously? And you said the 60s was the golden age of um, Sri Lankan theatre, mm -hmm. with Tamil dramas being shown, like in places like Lana Vent, and the audience was very much mixed. Something that we probably can't even imagine now. I think uh, Kanchuka, that you know, with the Tamil actors and 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 Sri Lankan audience being mixed. Um, Tell me something about that age, you know, Ravana, uh, the, the people who uh, wrote the dramas at that time, both Singhala and Tamil, and how much cross fertilization happened? Yeah, um, so um, I think before the, this revival in, in theater, in the theatrical arts in, in Singhala and Tamil, I just want to uh, go back a little bit and talk a little bit about what uh, Edirivar Sarachandra was doing because he was such a transformative figure when it came to, came to theater in Sri Lanka. 
so he was he was very much involved in translations translations of mostly um, light satires and something that he started realizing in the 19, late 1940s and early 1950s was the fact that these light satires did not actually speak to the times because there was this huge cultural revival in literature in Das in, in all of the fields um, with this idea of a newly emergent um, uh, nation. And um, yeah. Uh, Kanchuka, if we step back even a little bit further back, there mm. was Nurti Nadagam, right? Yes, yes. And that had South Indian influence quite a lot, I believe. And we had um, the Hall Theatre and all that, where troops actually came. And yes. was, uh, yeah, right it was in thinking that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry? So I, I'm, I'm right in thinking that there was quite a lot of influence that Sri Lankan theatre got. Right? Yes, especially with Noorthi, which came in the late 1800s. Actually, theater, Singhala theatre in Colombo was very much influenced by Noorthi, as well as Tamil theatre in the north. So uh, these troops came to Colombo as well as Jaffna. Um, and uh, so already there was this kind of... Um, uh, influence happening from India. But prior to that, as you said, uh, the Nadagam style, which existed for almost a century uh, to that time, I mean, it was very much influenced by South Indian Kutu tradition. So when uh, Sarachandra traveled all around the world and then came back to Sri Lanka and decided to focus on the, uh, sorry, on, on the um, Nadagam form, um, um, it, it um, he um, was um, give me a second. So he was very um, Madhubhashini. I think I I lost my train of thought. Sorry. So that's fine. I was just thinking about the Nadagam. Yeah. And one thing that we are erasing, Kanchuka, mm -hmm. with Maname, yes. we talk about Kabuki, No, and yeah. all that jazz. Mm -hmm. But we hardly talk about the Tamil influence that came into Maname, right? And I find that very problematic. Is there actually such an influence? Have we just coolly forgotten it? Or what was the situation? I think that is where you were coming to. Yes, right? that's where I was. Right. Thank you for reminding me. I have to forgive, talking. you have to forgive me because I keep interrupting when I want more stuff no, up. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. Okay. So this yeah. is something that, I mean, even when I was learning about Maname in school and even in the university, I mean, I was learning about Maname as being influenced by No and Kabuki and all of the Western forms of theatre. But um, I, I really didn't, I mean, till I went really deep down into this research, I did not realize that Maname was was uh, transcreated by using the note for, uh, by using the Nadagam form, and that Nadagam was very much influenced by South Indian Kutu tradition. So it, this this really brings us to this whole idea of writing narratives of history, right? I mean, what gets written down and what gets excluded. And I think when you look at so many of the works that have been written, uh, there, there are so much focus, as you said, Madhubashini, on No and Kabuki, but not so much on Kutu. And that's a question that we should, I mean, it's not that it's not there. Some people actually do write about it, but not very extensively. And th that's a question we can ask, right? And it, it again brings us back to this whole idea of writing history. Um, uh, Kanchika, was something also happening with when Manime was, uh, it was um, put forth in 1956? Uh, 1956, 56? yes, yes. Right, so it was so it's a very, 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 very significant year with the Singhala only. Yes. Yes. What was the parallel development happening in Tamil theatre at that time? Were they also going through some kind of re revival? Did they also come something like parallel to Maname? Did they also come up with something like that? Or did mm -hmm. Maname influence them? Yes, there was a simultaneously, I think, as when, uh, when, when Singhala theatre was developing, there was a, a revival in Tamil theatre as well. And uh, one of the very interesting things about this uh, phenomena is that when Manami was first staged in the Vala, that was the third stage. Manami was first staged in Lionel Vent and then in Kandy and then at the Vala. That was the third, third staging. Vala uh, being Pera right? Yes, right? Sorry, I have to explain this. this <laughs> you are using the Pera so so lingo. I should have Sarah also Sarah. said... <laughs> I should have also said, Kanchika, you are the head of the English department at the University of Pera Denia. Right? No, I'm not the head. No, no, no. no. Sorry, that was senior lecturer. Yes. Yes, I'm not, <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm not the head. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so, so this is Sarachandra, open air theatre, named after him because he is the one who got the idea of, of building a theatre, constructing a theatre in that geographical location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Anyway, when we first staged, uh, was this, I, re I remember Professor Tirukhandaya, who was in uh, the English department when I was a student, he used to talk about this moment. He said, when Manami was staged in 1956, at the uh, Sarachandra Open Air Theatre, he said that it was electric. He said that he knew that something had changed. Um, and so in that audience was also these other professors from the Tamil department. There was Professor Vittanandan and there was Mauna Guru now, Professor Mauna Guru, who was a student then. And when Professor Vidyanandan was watching Maname, he saw Kut. And, uh, and then uh, Mauna Guru was there. At that time, I think he was 19 or something. He was a student and he was trained in Kut. And he also saw Kut. So the two of them decided we need to figure out the roots of our own theatre. And so they started on this journey of uh, sort of rediscovering their roots and came up with uh, what is called the Nondi Nadagama in the 1960s and then the most, the well-known play Ravanesan in the 1970s. Um, and which again... Ravanesan was a retelling of the Ramayana from Ravana's point of view, Kanchuka. What exactly was that? Ravanesan is a retelling of uh, the Ramayana from, from Ravana's point of view, and they don't use uh, Valmiki's edition, they actually use Kamban's South Asia, South okay. Indian edition. And the hero is Ravana in that? Yes, yes. I mean, um, yes, he's, he is basically the hero. He is portrayed in a very positive light, unlike in, in Valmiki's Ramayana. I guess a Sri Lankan writing of Ravana, if you don't do it that way, it looks a bit strange. <laughs> you know, the, the rewriting I always find fascinating. Okay, so if we yeah. move, if we move from Sarachandra and if we get into resistance, something Kanchuka that you had said, even within drama itself, it didn't take much long for people to protest at that stylistic <laughs> uh, the kind of the fancy. Um, a uh, fancy kind of uh, putting a show and you talk about Sugata Palasil, but shall we talk about that group? Yeah. yeah, before saying that, can I just go back a little bit and talk about uh, Professor Kanapati Pillay's work because otherwise I think I draw yes. too much of a romantic picture about Spring okay. and WC. Because okay. so this was also in 1956, uh, Professor Kanapati Pillay was also a professor in the Tamil department. And uh, when Maname was done simultaneously, Professor Kanapati Pili did this uh, play called Traitors. And there he actually talked about a separatist group demanding a separate uh, state within Sri Lanka. So it's very significant, right? So this is, I think he was responding to the Singhal only act. Um, right. And, and yeah. then also it wouldn't have been long before they realized where it was going. No? Yes. So yes. 56 would have been quite painful because that I think that marks the first time that the independent country saw mm. possibility of division. Yes. And it's also called the first uh, the first ethnic riots in the independent country. And yes. you know, we forget it because 83 kind of made that the most important thing. But you know, the attacks on golf face, they were they were protesting. And yes. then and Kanchuka is fascinating because in for my doctorate, I read about the, you know, the poets and how things changed after that attack. Mm -hmm. And they realize, so I can imagine in the drama field also, things changing and this traitor happening that early, you know, mm -hmm. artists can be quite prophetic. That, that, not, that is so true, no? Yeah. That could so have it's a very happened. kind of contentious, complex uh, relationship that, ex uh, that exists between these uh, two theatres. Two theatres. Yeah. And then... Um, Let's 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 get to Apekatya later, and then the complete division happens in eighty three, right? Where you say they just disappeared from the Colombo scene. We'll come to eighty three and come back to the realistic uh, form, Kanchuka. What happened to Tamil drama subsequently? Yeah, so, so Tamil and Singhal drama. So this is this is very interesting because I also didn't know this till I did this research because this is not something that we really learn. Um, and in there, and unless you really sort of go deep into it and dig for this material. And I think the other problem is that most of the stuff on Singhala theatre is written in Singhala. Most of the stuff on Tamil theatre is written in Tamil. And there's not much translation happening between these. Yeah, two and I think, I think that feeds into the problem we are having right now, Kanchuka, because we only yes. have official versions of what happened and how yes. much artists work together. And we are not going to get there. But if you think about the starting of Singhala film, mm. the Tamil actors, Oh, yeah. You know, 
being the heroes and we just forgotten until till the 83 burned down the studios and here professor Siva Mohan is very uh, clear about that. We forget mm. how integral, I mean, mm. who Sri Lankanas was there, which now we have completely, you know, um, forgotten. Mm. So let's get back to drama. Right? Yeah. Yes. So 83 was the turning point. And Professor Siva Thambi talks about this, Kulante uh, Shangmugalingam, he talks about this because one of the things that happens is that. Uh, till 83, the Tamil theatre and Sinhala theatre sort of go line, sort of parallelly to each other and plays are staged in uh, different uh, theatres in Colombo. I don't know whether it's the Lion and Wind, but I think several theatres in Colombo. And then after 1983, what happens is that most of the theatre artists, they go to Jaffna or they go to the East. And, and actually, I think the majority of them, like uh, Balendran, uh, uh, Tarsi years, they, they actually migrate to England. I mean, they, they still continue to do theatre there, but I, I think it's it's a huge loss, you know, I mean, uh, these artists deciding to leave. So after that, what happens is that um, in most of the accounts written about Sri Lankan theatre, it, it's as if Tamil theatre sort of ended after 1983, but that is actually not what happened. Uh, in Jaffna, there were certain theatre artists, especially people like Kulante Shanmugalingam, who um, continued to do theatre, but it was not easy. Because for one thing, um, uh, the spaces uh, um, were not safe, so they had to find safe spaces. So oftentimes what Shanmugalingam did was that he actually performed in his backyard or his front yard, his house or found some space uh, that is safer, uh, that was safe to perform. And uh, so, uh, so theatre happened, but in a very kind of uh, controlled and constrained way. But in a way, mm -hmm. it also had the freedom of taking it out of the traditional theatre spaces, right? It had a weird kind of, I'm not saying it was better, mm -hmm. but a weird kind of freedom. And when we talk about street theatre, we'll, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. so, um, the Tamil theatre disappearing from, you know, the Colombo scene and going back yes. to the north kind of stabilised the division that we still see. I mean, yes. I don't think there's any Tamil um, uh, play that is performed uh, in Colombo very rarely. They, are, they must yes. be having a drama, drama Krishna Hall, I don't know, but, you know, it's not within the discourse that is mainly found here. Um, Kanchika, I want to go back into Sarachandra and the resistance he got within the drama world also. Mm -hmm. You know, when Sugata Pala Silva brought the uh, realist trend. Okay, mm -hmm. and let's talk about that and whether the Tamil theatre also saw that, whether Traitors was actually a realist play. Can we get there? Yeah. Yeah, Traitors was a realistic uh, play and realist play and uh, actually uh, Prof uh, Professor Kanapati Pillai was uh, involved in uh, realist realistic, realist plays and... Uh, Is there a parallel to... time frame with Sugata Pala Silva and Ape Katya? No, this was actually parallel to Sarachandra. I see. Is parallel oh. to Sarachandra okay. because even in the 40s, he was also doing very light satire sort of uh, stories about how to marry your daughters, how to find dowries for your daughters, <laughs> that kind of stuff, very middle class uh, light satires. So 1956, he sort of changes direction and writes this play a serious play about asking for a separate state. So, then, so that's a break. Right. So then in the 60s and 70s, I mean, Sri Lanka being part of the global political ideology and especially Sri Lankan, there was a lot of, you know, left-leaning intellectuals mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. And there was an eye out for poverty, injustice and all that. And you name some uh, vital place that happens during that time. Shall we talk about that a bit? You know, give me the names of the plays you have mentioned here. And, yes. and they were always in protest for something. Yes. So what was the early 60, 70 that you can see? What were they protesting about? Um, I, I think one of the things, I mean, one of the main plays that come up here is uh, 1973, Jagoda's uh, Malau Negative or The Dead Awaken. And this play he writes in response to the 1971 youth uprising, JVP youth uprising, and uh, what happened subsequently. And um, here, this play uh, sort of speaks of uh, one of those initial moments where 
theater was censored because he was allowed to do the play, but he was not allowed to perform it in a public space. So he had to perform it in a private space. And then um, again um, in the 1970s, uh, in 1976, um, Parakraman Realist is a really, really important play. And this was one, one year before the open economy was introduced. But one year before the economy was opened up, liberalized in Sri Lanka, and he almost see the future, as you said. He sees the future, and this is what uh, some artists do, right? I no, and, a, as I still did, told in yeah. my similar interview with you, yeah. I was actually a child and I saw this play. And yes. you know how the, 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 the farmer turns into an animal almost, going round and round the sector. Yes. It had superb music, some rhythm. You know, and I remember mm. that. And and it and here you say it's a story about how exploitation happens, you know, yes. globally, locally, and finally the person who's working, the worker who actually produces, is reduced to almost an animal, you know, the, the two two cows, you know, the two uh, kiripus, what what, what the kiripus name? and uh, uh, to something. Kiripangira, Pangira and Pangira and Kiripusa. Yes, so mm -hmm. and he loves this and how he also becomes almost a mute animal just working and exploitation. Mm -hmm. And as amazing, it was before the open economy was introduced, one year after, and you could practically even now see exploitation. And I'm, I'm like I always thinking when I talk about resistance in drama, can't you quite sad that the situation hasn't changed? In fact, it's got mm -hmm. even worse. So it's true, right? And since we are talking about Nirel the Sekpo, I mean, if you can remember the colors, I mean, he had the cows, he had the two cows, and he had the two sort of political figures, you know, one in blue, one in uh, uh, green, but they kind of mixed and they kind of intermingle, and you can't figure out which one is on the which side. And then you had Uncle Sam, you had the American flag coming in. So he was showing the way in which the common man, the common worker was exploited locally and internationally at a global level. It was, it was a super. Super. Yeah, and, and if you can put it on now, it will be so relevant. Yes. <laughs> Talk mm -hmm. about blue and uh, green mixing. Yes, yes. <laughs> because you, can, you can't figure out, no, in the end, even in the play, you just don't know what happened. Yeah. It's all mixed that, up in the end. That's the current parliament right now. So mm -hmm. I wish I wish we had that, uh, you know, dynamic uh, theatre tradition that uh, mm -hmm. existed then. Um, we'll talk about Niriel and how, how he's active even now. Let's get back to what's another play that you want to mention. You had mentioned about three or four here. Um, you, you want me to talk about the 70s or the yes, 80s? Yes, still yes, 70s because yeah. 80s changes quite a yeah, lot. And, and 70s, I think another play, uh, this again goes back to this whole question of censorship. And I, I do, I talk about um, uh, Swamaratna Visanayaka's Vedic Karyo. And there are two, um, what happens is that um, again, this play was allowed by the censor board. They did not censor this play, but then it was shown and there were the military, uh, there was a military group in the audience and they are the ones who actually censored this play. And this was, I think, the, f the first time in Sri Lankan history that a play was censored by the military. So, I mean, and I think that, that has happened later on now, especially with- I didn't even know it was allowed, uh, Kanchuka, that others could also censor dramas. I didn't know the military had to be consulted. I think there were some films which were censored by the military too. Yeah, maybe the law is maybe the law is if they use uniforms or refers to the army. I think there's some thing where you have to get permission. Maybe it's that, right? It must be, yeah. So yeah. it was never shown. No, then uh, I think Somarani Desanayake did something very interesting. He cho he changed the context, the time period of the play, and he shifted it to some ancient uh, kingdom some uh, he referred to some ancient king and that's then, the best part about drama no you yes, can go to yes. hitbalism and in yes. the 80s how many got a foreign country situation <laughs> when you knew perfectly well that's exactly what's happening yeah. Yeah. right yes. so when it was shown in yeah, it was shown. yeah yeah it was shown in a different uh, absolute different dice Right. Um, and I think they're talking about the 1970s, early 1970s, I have to talk, mention the Wayside and Open Theatre, the first political street theatre group in Sri Lanka. So this, uh, their work started in 1974. So if, I, if I'm if i to give a little bit of a background to them, um, the first uh, school of drama for actors was uh, 
um, uh, started in um, in the Lion and Wen Theatre by Dhamma Jagada. It was called the Ranga Shilpa Shalika. And people from all over the country came to study drama uh, to this space because this was the first of its kind, especially for people who were speaking Sinhala, who, who worked in Sinhala. And so there are stories of Parakrama Niliana coming from Ratnapur, Eche Terera coming from somewhere in Colombo, and then um, Vikrama Senevrat has this wonderful story about how he came from this very rural village with this small suitcase. And he said it was the first time he came to Colombo. And then he was just um, like so surprised by everything. <laughs> and then um, there was, I think there was only one woman in the group, Kumari Moravaka. And then there was Hema Siri Abhavadan. So there was, and Garmini Hetiyaraj. So all these kind of very well known theater personnel who, who got trained in this space. And, and mind you, this was three years after the first JVP uprising. So some of these uh, youth, some of these young men and women, they had been part of uh, some of the social up, uprising that happened. And some of them, some of them were very left leaning. And um, so, but one of the things that they felt as they were in the Ranga Shilpa Shalika, which, which took place in the Lion and Went, was the fact that they were in this rather elite kind of theater based in the uh, in Colombo and performing theater to a very select audience. So one of the things that they kept on thinking about was how do we take theater to the people? How do we make theater accessible to the people? And they've been quite, I mean, they were talking about this among the students, but they didn't exactly know how to go about doing it. When uh, And that is the point in which uh, Swamarat Nabarasuri, who was studying in France, um, he was studying alternative theater. He came to Sri Lanka and he uh, delivered the lecture at this Ranga Shilpa Shalika. He was then a lecturer at Kalania. Was he already a lecturer? Or I'm, not sure. I'm, I'm actually not sure about that. Oh, okay. um, he uh, became a lecturer. He did, he did. Yeah. 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 So he was doing his PhD on alternative theatres. And then he spoke about the 1968 student movement and all of the alternative theatres that were happening in Europe. And then people like H. A. Pereira and Paratran were so excited because they felt that okay, this is this is the sort of thing that we want to do. And then they thought about all of the teachers in the uh, in the school, and they decided, okay, it it, it has to be Gamani Hakatogamu who, who will come with us. And then he, they actually went to him and asked him, sir, would you like to come with us? Who was Gamani at that time, Kanchika? Gamani Hakatogamu was a teacher in the Ranga Shilpa Shalika. He was teaching, directing, and acting. Um, and by that by that time, he was also a lecturer at Kalani, and he had done a lot of experimental work. Um, especially outside of the proscenium, outside of the enclosed theater. So he was more than happy to travel with this group. And uh, so in 1973, they, they, 1974, uh, they get on the train and they go to Anuradhapur and they have their first performance. And um, I think uh, the story of them coming back to Colombo is very important because they go to the train station and as they are waiting for the train, they they come up with this idea of doing another performance. And then I think it's Parakram Niriyal who asks, okay, where do we perform? And then Gavini Hathetugama, they have this sword and he goes brandishing the sword around and he comes and says, okay, this is where we are going to perform. And I, I, I was thinking about this because we had this conversation a few days ago, right, Mantubhashani? I mean, that whole idea of what is a performance space? I mean, Hathitogama said, okay, I, I decide to make this a performance space and this is the performance space. Because right now we have such clearly demarcated performance spaces. So I think that's, that's a very significant moment in political street beauty in Sri Lanka. And quite dramatic also, no, to put a sword <laughs> like the King yes. Arthur sword. Like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I, no, you knew him, you know, he's a very dramatic person. Yeah. Unfortunately, not closely, but of course, I was in awe of him. I've heard of him and I've seen yeah. him, like, you know, in, in all that. And street yeah. theater caught on so well, especially within the university uh, spaces. In Javadanapur, I know, like, I've seen people. Students, you know, use the parts in, in theater and drama. And if you were, I, I know you're based in Peradeniya Kanchuka, but if you came to uh, march with the artist when they went to uh, Gota mm -hmm. Gokama, it's practically straight theater somehow. Yes. yes. They were dancing and they were like, 
were showing in dramatic form things were happening and the better and the music because music is also quite a strong feature no the drumming and all that in street theater yes 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 definitely yeah right. and I, yeah go ahead oh, sorry no you go ahead no no i just want just since you mentioned uh, golf face i mm. wanted to make a comment about that too i think what is happening in golf face is also these artists and people going and reclaiming these spaces it right. might be just for a few days or a few hours but nevertheless i mean these spaces these public so called public spaces have been taken away from the people right these it's part of the neoliberal mm -hmm. agenda that the common spaces are privatized yeah absolutely i mean they are taken by as you said commercial capitalist enterprises the state and the military right so the fact that all of these artists are going there and reclaiming these spaces and performing in these spaces is pretty amazing i know and um, i think there is a clear distinct difference between may 9th before and after you know that the celebratory jubilation kind of ended with the violence that was unleashed so right now we are we are discussing kanchuka at a juncture where neither of us know yeah this is going to end yes. except know that yes. some people are hanging on really hard to ask mm. for the change that they wanted mm. going back to golf face it's interesting that you said there was a performance in golf face right of this yes. particular troupe and shall yes. we like beautiful that you have shown you know what they are selling it was about <laughs> against consumerism against yes. you know neoliberal consumerism and uh, you have to excuse the sound because ipl uh, <laughs> matches are going on and i have half the family completely committed to it um, and you know it's it's hilarious the, the artificial buttocks and all that can we talk about that kanchika that that particular play yeah i think it's it's, it's a pretty fascinating play so they decide so the the economy is liberalized in 1977 and then uh gamini hatsato gama and the wayside and open theater group they decide to do this play it's named open economy I and mean, yeah and anyway, so they decide they go to ball face and they have this uh, and they decide to sell all of these kind of absurd items although we call them absurd they are really not absurd madhubachi because half of them exist now so one is the electric back back stretching machine i mean those are very i mean those are available now right Yeah. Um, I mean, talking about artificial artists, buttocks is a bit hilarious, but I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, artificial buttocks. I mean, there are so much plastic surgery. If you look around, I mean, it's kind of crazy. I think it uh, exists. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then I find this absolutely fascinating: the idea of packaged air. Uh, I mean, there's a double arm to under with air uh, body air and all of that, but it, it's 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 selling oxygen. I mean, what what does that mean? I mean, in the past few years with COVID nineteen, I mean that is something. we saw how people were fighting for air yeah, so i mean but this is in the 19 this is in 1978 that that way it's funny we um, don't even find that silly you know package there it's, it's part of life now it's part of life it has become normalized and then the other thing is that there's a flexible backbone that does selling so one what the what the actor says that you can it, it turns to the left it turns to the right so going back to the uh, the that's how people must have bought that one though <laughs> <laughs> so again uh, that was the was satire on what was happening with the politicians so i didn't know that it was a, there was any other incidents in 1978 i guess there was i think it's a thing now no they yes. must have bought a lot of that yeah um, so. kanika but you were telling a serious thing that was happening with yes. that production right yes. and you know what actually happened when they yeah so then there was this one uh, item that they were selling it snow boots and then suddenly one person in the audience had said um why are you selling snow boots this is a um tropical country and then one actor had said uh, we are going to import snow also and apparently the year before they had imported snow for a carnival and uh, so it had gone the haggling had gone for a while Uh, the, uh, and Gami Hatre Gami had suddenly realized that this is actually undercover policemen, the CID, trying to mix up the performance and trying to create some sort of scene. So they had this strategy when that kind of thing happened. They they would leave one by one, not as a group. They would disperse. They would go in different directions. Um, so th they had dispersed, uh, dispersed, and then one actor has this beautiful story about how he carried the. Uh, plastic buttocks <laughs> on the streets, but I think the serious issue here is uh, as to why these police came and disrupted this performance. I mean, it's the it it looks like this very innocent and funny performance, 
but this is not the first time that that has happened. Uh, performances in public spaces get um, interrupted often, oftentimes. And um, that, that's is the same interruption way. also welcomed normally as like immersive theater? Is it part of their idea? Uh -huh. Or like, is it something unexpected? No, I mean, it, it gets interrupted by the people. That's different, right? But when the authorities come, when the police come and they interrupt, normally it ends up in some of the actors being taken to the prison or something like that. So, And that actually has happened to Hatte Tuegamara? Yeah, when they were performing in Galevala, this was in the 1980s, early 1980s, uh, they were performing this uh, play called Polymo, the line in Galevala. And it, it's really kind of interesting um, uh, sort of interface of reality and theater because the, the, um, I'm not going to tell the plot because I don't think we have the time to go into all of that. But there's a policeman who appears in the scene. And so there was also a real policeman who had appeared in the scene, which they did not realize. So, um, so anyway, when they had uh, performed this play in Kalevala, they were, they were arrested and they were taken to the uh, police. But I think something that happens in Sri Lanka is that uh, there's all of these uh, sort of political connections and political figures who were, uh, who get offended by some of the things that are said in the play. And they send their local thugs to create a scene. I mean, I mean, the, I mean, it happened, no? On the 9th of May or so. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, it's crazy yes. how things don't change here. Yes. Yeah, so Kanchika, you did though go to South Asia and tell that, you know, in India, these can actually cost somebody's life. That, you know, this kind of resistance has happened. And remember, I said Suneta Rajakarna Nayaka has, yes. um, it's Nishkrantia. The book is Nishkrantia. If you can okay. read it, uh, Kanchika, mm -hmm. it, it, it's about a, a, a woman who has amnesia who's quietly finding out what her life is. And the reason she got amnesia was that her husband was an actor and they were a troop mm -hmm. in dramas, resisting the authorities and corruption mm -hmm. and how he was simply killed. And you, in the Singhala interview, you gave a real incident, right? Of someone being yes. killed almost in, in front of everyone else. What exactly was that? Yeah, so this is, um, I was referring to the uh, group Jananati Manch, uh, the People's Theatre Forum. Uh, they also started their work in the 1970s, 1974, I think simultaneous uh, with uh, the Wayside and Open Theatre. They were connected to the CPI, uh, the Communist Party of India in the beginning, and now they are connected to the CPIM, Communist Party of India, the Marxist Communist Party of India. And so uh, this was also a very young group, and um, their main intention was also to take theatre to the people. So, um, they were they mostly perform in the city for, for in factories and in open areas in in street in the streets and all and in in uh, in, in in the late eight, I think nineteen eighty nine they wanted to do a play called Halla Ball which means the strike in Jandapur. This is a city about one hour away from Del Delhi and um, Safda Hashmi was the leader of the group. And um, uh, so while they were performing the play, so the play is also, I mean, this is kind of interesting because even within the play, there's this young couple who wants to get married and uh, they can't get married because the salaries they make are simply just atrocious. So they can't even think about getting married in, in that salary. So the entire conversation that this young couple has is about how do we fight to increase our salary? So within the play, there's this policeman who comes and interrupts the young couple and tells them, okay, can you just please stop talking about increasing your salaries and just talk about something like love or something like something else. But then uh, constantly this young couple goes back to talking about um, uh, the really low salaries that they are paid and how they need to strike in order to increase their salaries. Um, and, and so it is, so that is the basic plot of the play. And so while this is going on, there's these um, uh, thugs again sent by the Congress party then. Um, and they come and tell the truth to stop the play. Um, and then uh, Safda Hashmi talks to them and tells them, this is just a play, let us finish the play. And then they leave and they continue the play. 
and uh, as they are continuing the plan they ask mind you there's thousands of people working i think there were about 7 to 10000 people working the plan like in sri lanka like there are so many people who come when when something is uh, staged on a uh, something is performed on a street or something there's like thousands and thousands of people who flock to watch a, watch the play um so the so <clears throat> as they are continuing with the play the, the hooligans they come with batons and all sorts of um, weapons uh, and again like uh, similar to the sri lankan group but the indian groups does it does is also they disperse one by one so safda hash be being the leader of the group he tells everyone to sort of disperse and people just run some people actually hide in houses and people are just so accommodating they take the actors into their houses they hide them in their rooms under beds and all of that and then safda hashmi is the one who keeps guard to make sure that everyone is okay and then so what the thugs do is that they beat him on the head 20 times i think this is um there's also a documentary about this i mean this is just such a that story it's almost as if they wanted to sort of destroy the place of his creativity and they take him to the hospital but he 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 dies the next day and the day after that his wife moleshri hashmi she is also part of the group she decides that they are going to come back and they are going to perform the play they are going to finish the play and they finish the play so i think there's all of these kind of sinister um results i mean these uh, sinister things that happen uh, when people decide to take theater out into the public to these public spaces and actually interact with the people. um that is a theater of resistance no and there is a price yes. to be paid yeah i think the uh, exam we have have we have examples here richard was killed yes yeah uh, you know 888 and then there are lesser known people who went missing and yes. um, you know richard is the most famous person but mm-hmm. at every point i mean if you take even you know university students you know 888 89 and can't you get it from there and then there is a clear distinct difference in the which you have mentioned in the dramas of the 80s right in what they are protesting mm-hmm. about yes um in the 80s um i mean if we if we um look at something like kb herat's uh, maya devi goddess of illusion uh, still he is uh, uh, responding to the opening of the economy so there he is again talking about the way in which uh, people have lost sense of their own humanity because the market has become the prime focus so he tries to understand what has happened to human relationships what has ha- happened to human connections in that context but if we fast forward to the 19 late 1980s uh, you can see um the way in which uh, artists are responding to the uh, 1987 to 1989 again uh, the jvp uprising the second jvp uprising uh, known as the time of terror the bishana samaya yes because yeah. had, uh, i remember in professor nirmal's interview he said there was a distinct difference in the level of violence between the 71 and the 88 89 because 71 yes. there was a desire to educate the people who they thought were going the wrong way but 88 89 was don't take any prisoners if you if you see a mad dog kill them and the level of violence mm-hmm. and it's very interesting and i think you have mentioned professor obesekar ranjini obesekar's book mm-hmm. and also 88 was the year that the most amount of singhala drama was uh, staged yes maybe protest mainly went there given the danger of opening our mouths you mm-hmm. know during that time so censorship was there repression was there so many things were there that protest may may have found the biggest opening in drama would i be right in saying that you think um, kanchuka uh, that is actually the argument that professor obesekar makes in her book uh, uh, sri lankan theatre in a time of terror she says that she argues that in the 19 late 1980s 1988 1990 1989 those were the two years in which the most uh, plays were produced in sri lanka i mean i don't know if i have the numbers here i think there are about 180 plays produced in 1988 and it's just unthinkable and 
in a sense, as, as you said, Madhu Bhashini, in a context where every form of dissent was forbidden, maybe artists found a safe haven or a, or a platform of protest in theater, and that is what um, Ranjini Obeseker tries to, I mean, that is what she says in her book. Kanchuka, the reason yeah. I think this is true is I used to belong to the Kemadas Orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, because his daughter and I were in the same class, she played the cello, I played the violin. Mm -hmm. So we used to be taken, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, Dawala Bishana, the opening night, the uh, Dawala Bishana is men without shadows, right? And they had said it mm -hmm. happily in France, and it's about a group of young mm -hmm. people trying to make a difference. And they have torture scenes, they have you know, this beautiful little boy being killed. And mm -hmm. I remember Kaushalya Fernando carrying that child and coming forward. Um, Kanchuka, the feeling of that theater, mm. right? They yelled when there was torture. They were actually shouting. Mm. They knew and when the military came, they, you could see the anger and, and, and the military was of course French military, but mm. the army and the behavior was absolutely Sri Lankan. And Kemadasa was such that, um, you know, you had a, I think it was Anna Venta I can remember you have a number of seats available now, and you close to and say house full. What house full? People used to punch <laughs> on those doors. Really? And came wow. and came. That's it, open it. And I remember looking back because the orchestra was under the stage. Hmm. Looking back and seeing like a river flowing down of people. Now, mind you, it was all house full, right? Wow. Just flowed down, sat on the aisles. I had people on my feet practically. They wouldn't care. They were just looking at the, the, the pain and the anger and the catharsis, which, you know, original theater was meant to engender. That's how theater was born, you know, the catharsis, mm -hmm. the, the feeling and the crying and the pain. And you, you wouldn't believe it now, Kanchuka, where we are more or less, you know, caught to the, the, the visual media of, of cinema. Mm -hmm. No, that was physically there. And I spoke, I, Kausha and I had a uh, talk about resistance. Yes. Kausha remembers this as well. Because they were, you know, they, are, they, they take away the toenail, like the, the, they, they take away the fingernails. Mm -hmm. And the toenails, and we knew outside, this is how mm -hmm. JVP insurgents were tortured. So mm -hmm. when that boy shouts, everybody here shouts. So it's like mm -hmm. amazing. That is why I said, I have physically seen, I mean, I led a, pretty protected life compared to what the, 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 the people actually were going through. But because mm -hmm. of my uh, involvement with Kemadas and Davila Bishan and all that, mm -hmm. is something I saw and how much theatre meant at a time where just speaking out meant death outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would like to respond to that. I think in a way that is also bearing witness to this historical moment, isn't it? I mean, I think that is I, I was also thinking about Dhananjaya Karunaratna's Juria. Perhaps you've seen that at that time. I think it was it, it was during the same period. I haven't, uh, Kanchika. What is that story? So that is also this. Uh, it's a story. It, it's sort of absurd, this Brecht, Brechtian kind of work. But they also what Dhananjaya does is that he comes up with this character who grows up separated from society, and he comes to the society and um, he comes. He works as a garbage, uh, um, he, he works as a municipal cleaner. And one day as he's cleaning the garbage, he finds this severe, severed uh, leg in the garbage heap. And he's really upset and he tries to sort of talk about this to other people, but no one wants to respond to it, including the police, the lawyers, the religious uh, personnel. So everyone tries to sort of chase him away. It's, he's a nuisance. So, I mean, but then he, um, so again, mind you, he grows up outside of society, according to this play, right? So, uh, so what Dhananjaya tries to do in this play is to so, show the way in which violence, in a sense, was kind of normalized at this time. And um, I think going back to what you were saying uh, before, uh, 87, 89, what you see is that um, there's almost a public display of bodies and, and thus uh, violence. And uh, it's almost a warning by the state saying, okay, this is what's going to happen to you if you do not believe. We had you did not do a drama, as you say, yeah. because the body is yeah. uh, exhibited. Yeah. It was like, you know, even in Peradena, you had that, you know, in the pond, 
Yes. Heads. So yes. dramatic exhibitionism was almost a thing during that period, right? Apart yes. from the real drama that was happening. Yeah, and I, and 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 that is something that Nogogi Bhattiyango. I mentioned this article in in the other interview also. I mean, this uh, he talks about in his article enactments of power. He talks about the way in which uh, the 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 way in which the state performs its power because the state actually the state actually has power, right? And one way in which the state performs power is by I mean when they display these burning bodies or these decapitated bodies in public spaces, that is a display or a performance of state power. So something that Nogogi says is that uh, the conflict is between the power of the state and the uh, performance uh, and the power of the performance of the artist. So the st st state has actual tangible power, whereas the artist only has the power of its perform their performance, right? But still that becomes a threat to the state. So in his article, he, he constantly <clears throat> raises this question, why is the state threatened by the artist's work? Because a similar thing happens to him in Kenya. He comes up with this people's theater in, in, in a village in, in the Kamirito region. And he starts working, he and Nugugiva Miri, they were, start working with farmers. And um, so rather than bringing a story from the city and telling the farmers, okay, this is how you should do your stuff, they actually have a real conversation with the farmers and they develop this, this story uh, through that conversation. And they try to they perform the play with the farmers in, in a space that they have created, in a public space, in Kamirito. And what the government does is that they come there, they destroy the space, they telecast it on public television. Okay, so this is where the whole idea of the, uh, the way in which the state performs its power comes to play. I mean, why would you show it? It's, it's very interesting, Kanchuka, if you take it to what we normally do on May 18th. This is one year where we didn't do anything. The performance of state power. Yes. Part of, it's part of, you know, how authority... I have to be quiet when um, you continue. Uh, 88, you also talked about, you know, Raha Sudhavir and mm. Piyal Karyavasam. And also, you spoke about the the... the technical theater mm -hmm. and people taking it out into the, you know, Kumuru and the Kamata and how people in that sense, mm -hmm. it, they are similar to India in that sense that people were so, that you, they actually took it off this traditional structure. Can we explain that a bit, Kanchuka? Yeah, actually, you, as, as you were saying that, I was thinking about this one performance by the Wayside and Open Theater and here, um, uh, this was again in the 1980s, and I, I distinctly remember something that Deepani Silva, who was a lifelong member of that group, she started in 1975. Uh, told me so an active protest at yeah, golf. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so they they have this uh, uh, performance called Obadutua, which means Obadutua, Amadutua, you saw, I saw, and what they basically do, does in that performance is that it's a short piece. Um, they have, uh, uh, so so it's about the second JVP uprising and how the young people were taken and they were tortured and they were killed and they were just sort of piled up in public spaces. So that is basically the story. And then the mothers go in search of these, uh, they are lost, uh, they, they are dead, I mean, disappeared children. Uh, and Deepani played the role of one of the mothers. It, it's a very touching, it's a very kind of, uh, it's a visceral piece. Uh, and Deepani recalls this moment they had performed this uh, play in Polonnaru, in a public uh, space in Polonnaru. And Deepani said, after the play, uh, this is this is just absolutely crazy. She said, after the play, the mothers in the audience had come to her and they had come to her and hugged her and cried and said, we also lost our children um, uh, uh, during the insurrection. And one of the audience members, some of the audience members had told her, you know, this space that you performed in was a place where the dead bodies of the young men and women were buried. So she said that was just, just shocking. So here you, I mean, they were performing this violent moment in history 
in a place where the actual uh, that his historical incident happened and and in a sense i think that is why um going to public spaces could be threatening also because you don't know i mean because not, no, no space is empty right there are such a history especially in our countries in this post colonial spaces there's so much violence i mean these spaces are this these spaces are ravaged by you know the violence of capitalism colonialism and then by our own governments local governments so so this is a very um i think it's kind of a really horrifying moment where the real event and the performance sort of intersected in a unthought way and and for the for the spectators i mean they were witnessing something real i mean they were watching the performance but they were reliving that memory uh, deepani says that was a really really difficult moment um, that doing that performance um I don't know whether I answered your question. No, you did. You did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, also, another thing that if you take Asoka Hantagama's Magatha, Magatha, yes. thing that people did apart from like Deepani acted in a very real situation, mm. but they also tried to um, do it in a symbolic, allegorical fashion, right? Again, to probably uh, avoid the censor. And Magatha was um, about cows and their calves. Yes, yes, it's about uh, it. It was about this act, uh, law of killing cows. I mean, he he in the introduction he quite he very strategic strategically sets up the story so that no one could actually censor him. The censor board can't would not be able to get uh, the censor board would not be able to censor that play. And I think uh, Handagama takes a very smart step there. Very, yeah, yeah. And and one of the things uh, that I would like to mention is that in Magath also there are all of these references to bodies uh, displayed in public spaces. So he actually says that public spaces have become um, uh, uh, cemeteries. And um, one of the things that you and you see that in places like uh, Prasanna Jayakoti, Sevanali Sahab, Minisu, the same sort of images. There are all of these public spaces. I mean, you, they, they are they are piled up with. I mean, this is a very difficult period we are and talking about, right? Piled up with human bodies. And Kanchuka, I think there are some people who still believe in the importance. Ne, kaputek marala tatta kella na. You know, it's it's never gone. So you know that yeah. is the display. Like you warned others. So yes. it, it has yeah. a very clear purpose in in happening. Can we talk about Pial Karyavasam because I am an admirer of him as a fiction writer mm -hmm. and as a dramatist and you are talking about I think Raha Sudhavya, right? That yes. came during that time? Uh, no, Raha Sudhavya was staged in, um, I think it was staged in 2010, if I can, re if I remember correctly. So much later. Mm. Much later, yeah, yeah. I think it was very, um, uh, from what I remember, I mean, it was very poetic and very symbolic, but he tries to sort of, there was one scene where one of the actresses looks at the eyes of one of the men in the play and he, what she could see is this history of torture and violence and all of these things that we refuse to discuss as a nation. Um, all of this trauma that we have sort of left behind, we have sort of stored it somewhere and we, we, we don't want to talk about it. So there's barbed wire, there's knives there's blood there's skulls i mean it, it's all there in his eyes but they they don't talk about it and uh, i think in that when play, you say 2010 uh, have we come to the board then like the street that do people in the singhala theater mm -hmm. discuss the board mm -hmm. is also now we had like we had three problems 71 88 89 was a single insurgency yes, yes and then starting from 83 right up to 2009 we mm -hmm. had a war Right, and so things now the subject matter also changes. If you take the nineties, mm -hmm. was so was Pial's one discussing the ethnic those disappearances also. Two thousand yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, significant. Yeah. yeah, I I don't think it was very overtly discussed, but it was there. I think those implications. I I think it was all of uh, sort of talking about. Uh, this is what I understood. I might have very. I don't know whether I. This is this is my reading of the play. Um. I, I think he was talking about all of these unspeakable things in our history. 
and even within the play no one was forthcoming with this information so it was very kind of it remained sort of underground or kind of it was inside i mean it 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 was, it was not on the surface but i think there was reference to all these incidents it was all connected yes and yeah. uh, how much if i if i were to ask you this how much was sinhala drama invested in resisting the war that was going on kanchuka yeah that's that's a really that's a really important question and it's a difficult one to answer also because i mean this is something that i think about often because why were not there many plays that was uh, written and staged about the war because i mean if if you if you look at singhala theater it's, it's it's a handful of plays uh, that were written about the war um, and uh, people like ranjini obeseker and michael fernando they they talk about this issue and uh, uh something that they say is that why did singhala dramatist most singhala dramatist miss this very significant issue in sri lanka's history because i mean if you go to someone like shanmugalingam who's who's producing plays at this time in in jaffa you see the same sort of images i mean he's talking about bodies piled up in public spaces in jaffa this so you find i mean when you when you look at the say i mean he's also talking about public display about, about a public display of violence like in sri lankan young men dying sri yes. lankan young men and sri women dying yes it's that we forget to see it that way because we are yes. divided by ethnic yes. uh, lines so mm. when you look at those places it's like similar images but it's like totally different incidents and it's just it's yeah you don't want to think about i mean you wonder like why it can you yeah. you though you did something because i know you uh, did a play based on kumari kumara gamage's uh, work and uh, i'm an admirer of kumari kumara gamage because she's not known as a creative writer but she's an extremely powerful writer and i remember with part of a research i did i called her to get her involved in the research and her first thing was i'm not a creative writer mm-hmm. right and i'm like yes i i get that because she said everything i wrote, write is true and i said it's just the way you write it you can easily be one of the best creative writers in stylistics and in form so she did agree to uh, do something and i have translated two of her gehanu katha which hopefully you might see soon and uh, kanchuka you also picked her up as somebody worthy of reading as a, as as a writer and um, can we talk about what you did with her work and i hope you still have the video open because i would love to show it and uh, we forgot to discuss that doesn't matter let's, let's uh, no, what <clears throat> what is um, what was okay back tracking again what is your personal involvement at, for the all this time we spoke about your academic work and your research into it but you are also an active uh, actor and a director kanchuka shall we talk about that and uh, get to the place where you actually produce something by uh, kumara gama <laughs> Yeah, actually i come to my academic interest in theater to my uh, through my practice in theater because i've always just i mean i i love theater i mean i mean being part of it watching theater it's it's just absolutely inspiring and it that is what sort of draw me to um look at theater for my doctoral work as well so there's there's so it's the creative and the uh, the more analytical thing goes side by side and sometimes there's a conflict also um so kumari kumari gamage um i first got to read her short stories um ketikara pudiga katha um long stories which are shortened um and then gayanu katha women stories and then uh, noa so kanmalata um the years which have not heard um and I, my mind was i, I was so kind of taken by the stories they were so powerful and the way she created all of these images i mean they were they were just devastating images but i had um um the moment i read them i i i thought i have to do something with this work um because it was just uh, it was very vivid and i i i also think this is another issue here right i mean because we don't get so many accounts of what is happening in the north and the east for our i think now there's a little bit of translation happening but not again not so much right uh, so so after i read them 
I thought I wanted to make a play, but I didn't know how to go about doing it. And then I met Kumari, and then we had this conversation. And then we got, I got this, we got this. Kumari book. herself is an actress. No, I've seen her yes. very powerful um, acting in Gayatri Kemadasa's play. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's, a, she's a very powerful actress. Um, and um, so we got this uh, group together and we devised a play. I mean, we had Kumari's uh, poems as well as um, some poems by Bertolt Brecht. And so that is all we had. We did not, we did not, we didn't have any script. And um, we worked for about eight months and we developed this play with some of the stories uh, in Kumari's book and also Bertolt Brecht's poems. And it was, uh, it, it was a very difficult process because it was a very difficult process for some of the students too, because in a sense, some of them told me that this was the first time that they started thinking about these issues in, in a serious way because they said they grew up with watching news where um, they showed all of these images of people being killed in Jaffna, but it was just like, you know, 100 were killed, 200 were killed, but like they, they said they never thought about them as being people. And they were, I mean, they, I, I think they went through a really difficult process doing it too. So the troop was made up of your students? Uh, students and some outsiders as well. Outsiders. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is it possible for you to get it on video and share? Uh, yes. Um, just give me one second. Let me also share the screen with you so that... Uh, You are share. You can share screen share now. Should you wish? Yes. Let me. Um. One second. Okay, I, I think I can now, okay. I, wait one second, sorry. No problem. We could hear, see it, but not hear it. Yeah, yeah, that's why I, I forgot to do the sound.
think you are mute. Muted. The words of hunger, ne? Samasitiye sagin ne. That is hungry, just hungry. And um, you know, she's a powerful. I hope she'll be getting the attention she deserves as a writer. And I was just wanted to show you the difference she also makes in her books. You know, the like kind of the bullet holes and and all that amazing. All her books are quite uh, different in production. Yeah, works, works of art, and it's quite a quite a woman. You know, and um, that's a powerful thing. And also, that was a video or actual dra drama, uh, Kanchipu? Um, we had to do interviews of uh, theatre and video. Uh, okay. Sometimes there would be interactions. Sometimes the, what is on stage would be also kind of projected onto the screen. I mean, we tried to experiment with, with the limited resources we had. Um, um, yeah, so did you show it? Uh, we showed it uh, at Theradini and then in Kalambo Punchi Theatre. We showed the several, about four times at the Punchi Theatre. I mean, we wanted to take it forward, but it was a 34 people cast and it was. It was a How was the reception like, Kanchuka, for that, for that play? You could never take it to Jaffna, right? No, we couldn't. We were planning and we just couldn't. Jaffna University really wanted not to come. Yeah. I, I, I really regret not going there. Um, well, you can always do that in the future when things become, you know, less pandemic. This happened just before the pandemic, right? Before the pandemic, yes, one year, in 2019. So, so the pandemic kind of shut down many things for different reasons, yes. you know, than all that. So um, let's get back to the war and its discussion. Mm -hmm. Then you come, like, that's kind of where you end. You talk about Trojan women and, you know, that Mr. Bandana, it was working, like Antigone. But yes, there yes. were some works and it, it deals yes. with, you know, the commemoration and the permission to do so, mm -hmm. which I think till this year, till May 18th this year, where on, in Golface they did commemorate everyone who died. Yes. I don't think I, that's quite a first, no? Uh, oh, yeah. They mm -hmm. did, they commemorated everyone who died. Uh, not the official one, the unofficial uh, golf face thing. Um, let's get to the Antigone and the Trojan. Um. Yeah, Antigone, I think Antigone came at a really important juncture right, in 2009. Sometimes, Manal Kanchuka, towards the end of our interview, your mic gets a bit uh, oh, faint. Yeah, I think it's my kind of, I mean, it's no, no, it's always at the end of the interview, I noticed. It's no, like, it's just yeah. really my voice. No, it's something technical. Come a bit closer, not talk louder. Yeah, okay. Right. Better, yeah. Mm. yeah. I think your mic is like saying you've got to stop now, but we'll quietly quickly try to finish it. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, so 2009, when uh, um, Priyanka Ratnayaka was doing it, it, it resonated so much was what, with what was happening. In the north, because uh, Antigone on stage was trying so so hard to, it's so so hard to um, mourn her brother, and she was not allowed to do so by the state. And the same thing was happening here, right? Yeah, the right to mourn and that and be yeah. rejected. Yeah. Yes, and uh, even I, I, I think this time, uh, uh, Mah Mahendra Tiruvarangan, my friend in. In the Jaffna University, and something that he told me was that for the first time, even people in Jaffna got a little bit of space to mourn and to cry. He said we we got to cry for the first time. Um, but all of these years, uh, it, it it was denied. Um, so uh, so that 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 came out of Priyankara's play. So I have to actually also so so Malaka Subhasinga also did Antigone, right? Was it also simultaneous to this? No, that was, was Priyanka. That was sometime before. That was sometime right. before. Um, okay. I, I, I remember Kaushi as Antigone. That's how I remember the. I'm just wondering whether that was Priyanka Raspey or someone else. I, I was getting confused. Right. No, I, I don't think that was Priyanka Raspey. Uh, yeah. I think so, it, was, it might have been the same translation. It might have been, have been the same. Yeah, the, the very powerful because it, it spoke to the inability. To have the space to mourn and mourning is so important as mourning you know you can go to another completely different uh, dimension talk about the right to mourn and mourning itself as being necessary to find closure okay mm -hmm. uh trojan uh kantavo uh yeah I, I, trojan one was important in the sense that 
Mr. Bandar Naik, he he speaks about how he took this play to different locations, right? So, yeah, I I think your mic is mute, so I can't hear you. Right? Saying. No, I'm just nodding, and also, yeah, yeah. So um, so so that play is also, uh, I mean, that also speaks to what exactly what was happening. So I think this brings us to a very important issue. Although I said that there were not so many plays that were made about the war, I think there were many plays made about the war, not specifically. You're right now um, frozen, um, Kanchuka. So Dharma Siri Bandar Naika's Trojan Kantawa again, um, come back, is referred okay. to, yeah, you got stuck for a bit. It's about women, right? And, you know, loss, because finally when you, um, we didn't hear the last thing you said, uh, the Trojan Kantawa is about the people who finally bear the brunt of going through war, yes. right? Women, whatever. Yes. So, what is that an adoption of? That, that's an adaptation of uh, Trojan women, no? The, right, and, and by who? Uh, let me, I, I can't remember by whom. I, 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 let me find that here because um, I remember the, the different kinds of women mourning their, mourning their men. And you had beautifully given a this um, a summary here, and you had the most famous actors taking um, taking part in it, like Yashoda Vimadharma and I think Anuja Veera Singh and um, Jehan Aloysius and, and, and all that, I think. And um, you talk, let's go come to the present, Kanchuka, where yeah. you say now there are still people trying to forge what was lost and Parakrama Nirayala's Jana Karaliya is something, and we talk about Jaya Shankar. Um, mm -hmm. He's in the Eastern University, Jaya Shankar? The Eastern University. Yeah. Right. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk about what post-war, whether mm -hmm. we are trying to come back to the original, you know, the meshing that happened. What is Janakarali and Parakraman Iriyala? We spoke in Sekkur. We have mm -hmm. come back to him, mm -hmm. and he's still active, and there's such a thing for hope, you know, that we have people mm -hmm. then and now fighting. What is Jana Karalia um, Kanchuka? Jana yeah, Karalia, um, again, it, 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 it was a mobile theater. It was a paper stage. And, yes. um, and what is very important about Jana Karalia is the fact that it, it operated in both Tamil and Sinhala. I, I think that's yeah. the first in uh, Sri Lanka's history, in, uh, Sri Lanka's recent history, because uh, all the plays that they did, almost all of the plays they did, they, they did the Sinhala version of the Tamil. If it was done in Tamil, but they would do the Sinhala version. And uh, the actors and, and the performers within the group uh, would function as translators. I think that is superb. And also the actors... Superb, and I wish we did more of it. Oh, because yeah. we, we, we happen to fight with people we don't even communicate with. I mean, you would think, Kanchuka, that this country would be thinking of translation as one of the primary activities Absolutely. anyone should be dealing with. And we don't. We don't know what the Sri Lankan Tamil writers are writing, yes. unless they write in English. And I don't know about you, but I'm equally guilty. I don't. I only read the translations. Yeah, we have to give some credit to uh, Saminathan Vimal because I think he's been doing a lot. And Abdul Haq Larina, I think yes. he's been doing a lot of translations. From yes, and someone just did Dharani. I can't remember. This Sh Shahir, someone, Shahir, I can't remember. But, Few, but you know, you we can count it in like yeah, fingers yeah. of one hand, uh, Kanchuka, but this should be national level translations going on, you know. So, anyway, let's let's not get there, but let's go. So, Jana Karalia, is it an original play that they do or they translate um, to both languages international plays? They have, they have, they are all original plays also, but they also do. They do a lot of translations like Kapit Kamis, Parandas, so that is one of the plays that they did. And then um, the clay, uh, the clay cart, uh, Nati Karate. Nati Karate. Um, and I think Parakramaniriyal and Jana Karaliya were quite active till again the pandemic shut everything down, right? I mean, they were traveling all over the country and something like Parakramaniriyal. Uh, Kanchuka, your mic is actually giving up, I think, after one and a half hours. Yeah, That's a we'll, 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 bad connection. I no, think. no, you didn't. You had fine till now, but we'll finish quickly by coming to the present. So, Jana Karalia was traveling all over, including Jaffna. Um, 
If they go to Jaffna, yeah, yeah, they were in the yeah, they were in the north. They were oh, yeah. and 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 east also, right? And can you tell me about what Jay Shankar does in um, in the east? So Jay Shankar does uh, something called reformulation of the Porto tradition. So he is also a performer. And he has been very actively engaged with the performance traditions in that area. And what he does is that he uses these traditional forms, both the forms to talk about contemporary issues. Right. It becomes a bit controversial, and sometimes because uh, he's talking about gender, he's talking about uh, other issues, and some people are a bit critical of what he's doing. But I think it's a really interesting move because he's trying to figure out how to. Uh, critique contemporary social issues using absolutely, and which includes gender and caste and class. And yes. of course, in the in in our history, we had class and caste being what they resisted about. Though yes. in my conversation with you, Kanchuka, I, I kept to politics, but this article has almost half of it on gender, which mm. I did not touch because that maybe on another day we can. Um, get to that but i kept it to politics because at the moment what's happening in sri lanka is a political resistance yes. to a, a corrupt you know what we think might be a corrupt uh, regime so political corruption had always been resisted in drama so by having you here you gave a very academic kind of framework showing how very much part of resistance drama had been right throughout history and we you know, given the context that people wrote, things they objected to differed. It could have been neoliberalism, it could have been state repression during an insurgency, and it could have been, you know, ethnic uh, war that's going on. And now we have come to, to 2022, which is like incredible um, opposition to what our generation has just let pass. And some young people are still hanging on, even though, temporary measures are being put to contain the crisis. So can I say thank you to, for coming, Kanchuka, for explaining it in both languages to us. And I'm, I'm really hoping people will listen to the Sinhala and the English so that apart from everything else, I want people to get familiar with both languages. That's a side effect. But by giving a framework to what drama does, Right, I'm, I'm very grateful that um, you put a lot of things into uh, a particular frame. And I hope, I don't know whether we can afford these books now, but um, you know, there's a whole <laughs> South Asian um, thing uh, because drama has been all over. And I think even in America, you were with people who were protesting, right? During your PhD? Bread and Pepper Street, I worked with them for several years. Bread and Puppet Theatre, no? because when you think of America, we don't even think they have such uh, such dramatic troops where, where they are resisting, even even they must be resisting neoliberalism, if I'm, if I'm guessing. We don't think, we only see the, normally we see the, you know, the MTV kind of culture that comes in. So you have researched globally, locally, and I'm honored to have had you here, Kanchuka. So let me thank you again for your time. And, uh, on behalf of all of us, and I will see you in another context soon. Bye.